Okay. Hey, Deb. Hey How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. Happy Monday. Happy Warm Bed Street. Where, do you have your our mascot out there or is it on this side? No, Elmo is on the East Coast. Elmo oh. is on the East Coast. So he is he is cheering us along from 3,000 miles away, or cheering <laughs> you along 3,000 miles away. Cheering you along, I don't know, what yeah. is it now, 200 miles away? Yeah, probably about 200. Something like that. <laughs> well, if so, I go to New York, you should tell me I'll swing by your parents and I'll pick it up. That's Yeah, yeah. I don't know where I'm going up next, but. Yeah, because I, and who knows when I'm going back to Jersey. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and apparently, apparently I've been told that when I do go back, um i need to uh not go anywhere for 14 days yeah quarantine for 14 days yeah, so, yeah. i don't know we'll see yeah. it's, it's strange strange times strange times yeah Very as i keep times. saying to everybody you know everybody asks about the winery or whatever i'm like you know what it sucks but i'm healthy i'm happy you know like right. we're, you know we don't have the virus all is good you know yeah that, that's how I think, you know, we don't have the virus, you know, we go into the restaurant, we're, we're only open three days a week because, I mean, we're not even doing the business in three right. days. I mean, like Friday, we had no sales. Friday night, right. no restaurant sales. But, um, you know, we go in, we drink our kitchen wine, and, uh, you know. But I love the kitchen wine series. Love the kitchen wine series absolutely adore it so anybody who's watching this or listening later on you have to go to kitchen 330 on instagram um i are you doing well, it on Twitter? Um, michael the um kitchen wine series is on my my instagram hb wine goddess oh 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 okay hb wine goddess yeah i love it i absolutely i absolutely love it but um anyway today we are here for wine for best street and we are up to the letter j which completely blows my mind yes. we're season two letter j and we decided this month we are doing a region and it is the jura region and i am going to full out say it here i've heard of it i knew about it but didn't know much about it and I don't think I've had a wine from Jura before, except I'm going to go out on the limb and Jim might have given me a Jura at one time or another because he always shares Jim. Wait, I know why. Isn't Jack here? That's the Savoy region. Isn't that up in the Jura? I don't think it's, well, it's a different region, right? Savoy? I thought it was up in that area. Savoy is, is, is the region, right? Okay. So I think it's the same general vicinity, but not, not the same. Um, what I didn't realize was how close in proximity it is well, to Burgundy. Right. I would, that, I would have gone there after Burgundy instead of going back to Paris for two days because we had come right. from Paris. I would have gone over to the Jura region because we left from Dijon. Yeah. So you know? it's sandwiched there. And we'll get into it a little bit more, yeah. but like, this is complete sidebar stuff. Um, it's sandwiched there. And between Burgundy and the Swiss Alps, and so I have uh, I have iFit on my treadmill, and for the last two weeks I have been running up the Swiss Alps. I have done three mountains, none of which I can pronounce what they are, but the video, you know, it, the the incline has been pretty much fifteen percent the entire time, but I have been running up three of the Swiss Alps mountains and they are beautiful. And I told Mike that we need to go there because I need to be able to physically go up these things that I've been running virtually on the treadmill. Um, oh, so much fun. Um, anyway, so it's that time, Deb, we'll do a video and then we'll drink. Sure. Yep. All right, here we go. Why don't you sing with me? 
All right. All right. Welcome to Jay. And Jura. And Jura. And Jura. This is what I am drinking. And this is what I am drinking. So we both chose Cote de Jura. So what is your wine actually? Mine is a Trousseau. Mine is Jean Bordy. And um, I'm not going to even. I'm not going to spoil it. You're going to have to wait till the end to hear about oh, one. Okay. Oh, I was asking what was the grape variety? Is oh, it's a blend. blend. Oh, it's a blend. Okay. It's a blend. What is is yours a blend? No, mine is 100% trousseau. Oh, okay. Mine's a blend of trousseau. Um, uh, Pinot and Poussard. Poussard. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. Here's this lovely sound. Mine's a 2011 and I really, I found it in my cellar. Oh, okay. So I pulled it out and saved it for Wine for Bed Street. So I have no idea how it's gonna taste. Well, mine is a 2017. Okay, so now look at mine, look at that. Oh, wow, you are, you are, you are, see I now. Mean, you, that is aged. That is looking a bit oxidized. Um, yeah. we, so curious, because we'll get into that when we yeah. get into I'll talk about that in the characteristics. And it, could, it could be oxidized. It smells it? Yeah. Okay. Mine smells very peppery. Mine has lost all its um, flavor. It's not really oxidized, but it's very thin. Okay. All its flavor. Uh, Bummer. Very Pinot-esque. It's not showing well on the screen, but it's very light, which is what I learned Jura is about. Very peppery. So now I was, in my research, I was told this ages really well. So I'm kind of surprised. But then the cork. Where's, where's the thing? Nope, they're going through. There it is. See the cork? Oh, was yeah. What? So, live and learn. Yeah. All right. You know, so, that's, yeah. that's, that's the beauty of, of, of this, you know. Sometimes we like it, sometimes we don't. And here there's, a you know, a wine that's definitely on the bottom of the bell-shaped curve. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, shall we get into the history? Absolutely. Let me bring it up. Slides. Here we go. All righty. So the Jura region, let me just get my notes here, is known as Francia Comte. And it's located between Burgundy and Switzerland. And it's divided into uh, two areas. The areas, um, they're north and west of the Doves Valley and they're south and southeast. So and here's just, you know, you can see how close it is to Switzerland. Oh, I forget, you can't see my, my mouse. So <laughs> I do this every every time, every, every time. Uh, it's like talking with your hands. Right. Um, ooh. So, originally, that Jura, man naked. Where? Oh, the guy yeah, with the right yeah, I don't know. Maybe he's got a little shield in front there. <laughs> so, originally, it was occupied in the fourth century BC by the Sugani. It's a Celtic tribe, and the region became part of the Roman Empire after Julius Caesar's victory over the, the Gauls in 52 BC. And it was later settled by the Burgundians. And then in 534 AD, it was conquered by the Franks. So it's, it's had a lot of a- uh, Change of hands. Yeah, a lot. So- um, Pretty. I just thought it was pretty, yeah. Um, so it's named after the Jura Mountains. And the Jura, Jura belonged to the free uh, county of Burgundy known as 
known by the French as Franche Comte, and it's a name that was given to it in 1366. Now, in the course of in the course of life, in the course of history, there was a lot of different marriages, and it passed through different people. So um, it um, it was passed through the marriage to Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, and then he made the capital um, of the region Dole, and then a few more marriages and a few more passes down, and it was um, severed from Burgundy and um, in 1493 by the Treaty of, of uh, Selenus, um, it went to the Hasburgs. And then after the region, um, then after the, the Rhine of Emperor, Emperor Charles V in 1556, it passed to the Spanish branch of the Habsburgs. And then French Comte was often invaded by the French during the Thirty Year War. Dole was the capital until the region was conquered by Louis uh, the Fourteenth, and then the capital was moved to Besancon. So it, it 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 got changed over quite a number of times by emperors, by dukes, uh, by countries. Um, but I want to also let you know that on, on a side note, there is a certain dialect in Jura. Um, it's the Arpidan language, and it's still spoken today in rural areas of the region. So, wow. so this, this, this is the stuff that I love when I get to travel. I love looking at history, looking at runes, and learning all about that. Yeah, I do too. So this is the capital of Besicon, and I'm probably not pronouncing it right. Um, and it's nestled beneath an ancient citadel in the loop formed by the Dogs River. And the town has one of the oldest, finest public art galleries in France with a collection of old masters with 19th century French art that includes work by Cranach, Titan, Bellini, Rembrandt, Rubens, Goya, and more. And it's been nicknamed the Petit Louvre. here. Um, so in 2016, the French uh, Comte region was joined with Burgundy to form a new administrative entity of Bourguignon French Comte. It spans from Cote d'Or, Dubs, haut saone Jura, Naive, Saone et Lior, and the territory de Delfort and Ion. It's bound by the regions of Avignon Rhone Alps to the south, center to the west, and the Ile de France and um, Grand Est to the north, and Switzerland is to the east, and the capital is now Dijon. And this was established in 2014 because French President Francois Holland wanted to reduce the number of regions in metropolitan France from 21 to 13. So go figure. Oh, beautiful. Yes, isn't that? So Jura is a small wine region that makes red, white, rosé, sparkling wine, sweet wine, and fortified wine. Their altitude, topography, climate, and clay-rich marl soil brings a uniqueness to their wines. They are most famous for their Vinjon, or yellow wine, and that's an oxidate, oxidate of white, similar to Fino or Sherry. Fino Sherry. The grapes of the region are Savin, how do you say it? Savignon? Savignon. Okay, that's Jura's signature grape, Trousseau, Poussard, Pinot Noir, and Chardonnay. And I thought their yellow wine was really pretty interesting. Um, yellow wine is made from the Savin grape. Once fermented, it's complete. Um, it's it's kept for six years and three months in oak barrels, and it's bottled in a clavin. And its age capacity is one of the most important in the world. And every year, the first week in February, a different Jura village hosts the hosts the Perse du Vinjon, and it's a festival toasting the newly bottled vintage. And here we have. 
Um, the four main appellations in Jura um, are both is the first appellation of origin control that was appointed by France. There's the Chateau Chalon, home of the, the Vin John, and Litol, which is the Chablis of Jura, known for good Chardonnay wines and Cremants de Jura, and Côtes de Jura, which is a catch oil appellation for all of the wines made in the region. And beside wine, it's known for cheese and sausages. Yay! <laughs> so there's there's a, a lot going on there. I mean, for you know, a small tiny uh, yes, small tiny region. It's got a ton of history. I mean, just been you know tossed back and forth in the course of history between you know all different people and also heritages. You know, there was. France, Germany, you know, and um, I, I do wish I knew where it was because I would have gone there. Yeah, so um, while you were talking, I did a little check because I did think that they were near each other. And Savoie is, they're both East France. Okay. And it's kind of cool. Well, actually, I wonder if this will work. Um, Savoie is directly under Jura. So, oh, okay. uh, there. Yeah, yeah, it's right next to it. Yeah, right, so it's right below it. It's right below, and actually, even a little bit more east because the yeah. Jura comes on in and Savoy comes yeah. on up. So, it, it, it like hugs hugs the Jura. So, good memory, Jeff. Good memory. Sometimes I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm lucky I remember today, earlier today. Um, all right, so I'm going to get into the characteristics, and um, there's some repeat, but I went a little bit further in depth than um, than what uh, you you did. Yeah, I just did a basic because I knew that's what you were going to do. I just right our psychic vibes working together. Yeah, I didn't want to get too in that. That's your that was your department this month. Okay. So um, the Jura is actually one of the smallest wine regions in France. And it actually is only about 2,000 hectares, which is just 5,000 acres. So, like, that blows my mind that there's a whole region dedicated to that little bit. Okay. Um, it is located on the far eastern edge of France, and it is sandwiched, as you said, between Burgundy and the Swiss Alps. Now, as I was doing research for this, every article that I read so I can't give credit to all of them because like I'd have a list of 50,000 names here, but the words that they used to describe Jura were so funny. It was weird wine, obscure wine, offbeat wine, geeky wine, and the missing piece for wine lovers. <laughs> so these are all decanter, wine spectator, uh, de you know, um, wine enthusiast, all of those uh, articles. This is how they describe the region. And I have to admit, it started to make me a little nervous by hearing all those things. Uh, but what is cool, going back to the cool part of the Jura region is, or I should say sad, is that prior to the 19th century, the Jura region, as small as it is, actually produced the same amount, if not more, wine, bottle wine, you know, bottle production, than Burgundy. So for a small region, they produced a lot of wine. But unfortunately, they got decimated by phylloxera. And then after phylloxera, mildew came in and devastated them even more. And then World War I came in, and that was about it. And prior to the, that, that trifecta of a disaster, um, Jura produced about five times as much wine as they do today. So they really, really did get decimated. Uh, this is an image of the soil that you can find in the Jura, and that is marl and limestone. And there is clay on the upper level of it. And so it's clay overlays. And the soil allows for a large group a variety of grape varieties to grow in there. So you do get a lot of different types of grape varieties in the Jura region. 
Because of its location and soil composition, it is very often compared to Burgundy, but the region is a whole different climate than Burgundy. They see a much longer and colder winter. So this is the uh, Jura Vineyard in winter. And I just, I was like, oh, I kind of hate the snow, but that's really pretty. Uh, so the longer and colder winter, and they actually harvest, their average harvest is November and into December because wow. their season gets pushed back so much because of the cold weather that by the time it warms up, they're harvesting in, you know, late November all the way through late December. And that blows my mind. I mean, Karen, we, we harvest in October, like the second week of October. Our very first vintage we harvest we harvested in November and we were like, oh my God, this is so late. But typically it's up it's mid, you know, early to mid October. And they are typically mid November to late December. So I'm guessing that kind of like in New Jersey, right? November and December are cold, but we're not really getting that snow yet. We're not getting the consistent temperatures. And with this climate change, it almost seems like we're really not getting significant cold weather till almost late January, February now. Yeah. Um, and we have, we have been known now in the last, I don't know, five years to be getting our, our one major snow blizzard in March. And I know the last two school, uh, spring sports seasons, which opened on April 1st, there was snow on the ground for spring seasons. So our, our season is getting shifted back. Now, if they're already late, I'm curious as to what that's happening, what the climate change is going to happen to them. Um, so the other thing about this region is because it's so cold, that it's very difficult for the grapes to reach ripening, that they are allowed to uh, do chapitalization. So they are allowed to add sugar to the grapes in order to uh, get the wines to the level that they want it to. Um, white wines, and this, I kept, I'm gonna say this and I apologize because it's horrible grammar, grammar and it's not very good speaking skills, but I'm going to keep saying I was blown away by this fact <laughs> because almost everything that I learned about the Jura region, I was like, oh, my God, that's kind of cool. Oh, my God, that's kind of cool. So they are kind of reversed of what we are in terms of how they age their wines. So their whites are typically aged in oak, but their reds are aged in stainless steel. So their reds are are very light, which mine is, and their, their whites are aged in oak, so you're gonna get a fuller body. Now, Jancis Robinson apparently is a big fan of the Jura, and she states that the Jura is best known for their individualized grape varieties. So this is Pulsard, which you said is part of your uh, blend, yeah. and as she puts it, it makes vivacious rose-scented reds. Their next major wine, which is what I have, is Trousseau, and it makes deeper reds, intriguingly combined pepper and violent, uh, violet scents. But most exciting, according to Jancis Robinson, is Trousseau's progeny, which is what you were talking about, Sauvignon Blanc, mm -hmm. which should not be confused with Sauvignon Blanc, okay? And it is identical to the heady Traminer, but Endura is capable of making extremely intense, long-lived, full-bodied, dry white wines, as well as versions that are deliberately oxidized, and they are the grape that, it, that is the grape that is used for their yellow wines, which I will get into in a little bit. Now, again, this is kind of cool. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc was sold to Australia nurseries or to, yeah, Australian nurseries, but it was mislabeled as Albarino. So Australia was growing all of these vineyards of Albarino and falling in love with this grape variety. And then it turns out it's not Albarino, it's Sauvignon Blanc. 
So there is a large there is a large amount of vineyards in Australia dedicated to Sauvignon Blanc. And being the science dork that I am, again, oh my God, that's so cool. Louis Pasteur was born here and he was raised in the Jura region and he actually owned a vineyard, which I have read so many books about Louis Pasteur. I mean, I, he's like an idol and I had never known that he did it, that he um, owned a vineyard, uh, but he owned a vineyard near Arbois. So this is where he is from. Weather in Jura can be very unpredictable, as you would expect. The nearby mountains are known for stirring up a spring frost, and they have um, very heavy summer rains and even uh, a lot of devastating hailstorms. So it must be a very harid, you know, region to be a winemaker, to be a vineyard owner because there is just a lot of bad stuff that can happen in the environment. Um, Jura uh, does produce, oh, so you would expect them to produce Pinot and Chardonnay, of which they do, but they the Pinots are of much lighter body than what I guess we're kind of used to from California. And they make them extremely well, and they are thought to be the best values out of the Jura region. Now, here's the thing. They are most known for their oxidized wines. So they produce, uh, this is from an article from Wine Cooler Direct. They state that Jura is for wine lovers who love stinky cheese and roller coasters. So I guess it's, you don't know which, is it oxidized, is it not, you know, this is this type of wine, this is this type of wine. And then the stinky cheese, I'm going with the oxidized. So I was nervous to kind of drink this, but mine is not oxidized. Mine, is, the Trousseau is more um, Pinot-esque uh, with some pepper. Now, the region has five signature styles, which when you look at the label can help a consumer to decide, you know, figure out what they have on. So this is a Vajon, and that is what you said translates to yellow wine. This is an oxidative style, very similar to sherry, from the grape variety Sauvignon. The fruit is harvested as late as possible and is aged in oak barrels. The barrels are not topped off, so therefore they get a yeast layer on them, and <clears throat> uh, like a solera, basically, but they call it a voyal. And this forms on top, and it does protect from some oxidation. But after a minimum of six years and three months, the oxidized wine is bottled in these cool little squatty bottles that, as you said, were called clavelin. So if you're gonna buy this, you need to expect a very intense flavor with a high nuttiness and very complex spiciness. Now the next type of wine is called Vin Types. And this can also be labeled as a Cote de Jura tradition. And this is also aged in barrels, but it is allowed to oxidize, but it's not for the same amount of time as the Vinjon. So they are typically produced when the Voyal is not doing the job correctly. So they want to produce a Vajon, but the, the, the Solera or the Voyal is not doing the job that they're supposed to be doing. So they're like, uh oh, well, we don't want to lose this wine completely. So we're going to bottle this now and sell it off before it gets completely oxidized. So this is a kind of an introductory way into the Vajon. And it is much less expensive because it didn't spend that much time in, uh, in production. Uh, then Pale is a dessert wine that is super sweet. The grapes are dried for six weeks, originally on straw pallets, and that's where the name comes from because uh, Vin de Pau translates to straw wine. They are gently pressed, allowing to ferment, and then aged for several years. Typically made from Chardonnay, Sauvignon, and Pulsard grapes. 
And eat, when you have this wine, you are expecting a very deep colored wine and walnut and raisin flavors. That kind of is a little interesting to me because walnut to me is almost a fault on my palate. Um, but that's what they're going, that's what you're going to get. Next is uh, Masvin. And this is a peculiar style that, that really has me like, this is cool to me. The fruit, and that's what this picture is. The fruit is fermented while in contact with all of the pomace and mark, which is left after pressing. So it's kind of like um, whole cluster. I think that's their kind of a whole cluster, but they're pressing it and then throwing the pomace back in. Um, and this is usually served as an aperitif, and you can expect it to be rather spicy and have raisin flavors. And then the last one, which I kind of wish I would have found, was a cremant de jura. Mm. It's a cremant. So we all know what cremant means. It's a sparkling wine made from either Chardonnay or Pinot. And again, you're going to expect a fresh, fruity, and crisp style uh, sparkling that can be found as a white or a rosé, and apparently a great value. Now, the Jura, for such a small region, actually has seven different appellations. This information all came from the Jura Wines website directly. So AOC Arbois, which was created on May 15th in 1936, Born from the Celtic Ar and Bois, meaning fertile land, the Appalachian Arbois was the first French AOC to date. It is also today the first in the Jura by its production volume. So it has about 29,100 hectoliters per year. This Appalachian itself is spread over 12 municipalities with 766 acres. There are five grape varieties that are allowed to be um, under this label or in this AOC. 70% uh, is red, while the remaining 30 is white. And obviously the red dominates. This uh, region is uh, iridescent clay, siliceous, and compact marls. The next one, which is the second bottle, is uh, Chateau Chalon. This is known as the AOC of Excellence. This was created on May 29th, 1936. This uh, AOP produces exclusively yellow wine made from the Sauvignon grape variety. It is an extremely small AOC vineyard, produces a wine of excellence in a very limited territory. Only 60 hectares are used to create these wines. Since 1958, the AOC Control Commission has been passing through the vines every year and they check on every single part of this. So the vines that are in the vineyard all the way through the bottling gets uh, checked by the AOC Control Commission. The third bottle is AOC Leato, and this is known as the Celestial Appellation for Exceptional Wines. This was created on July 31st, 1937. It was named after a star because the village is surrounded by five hills forming the branches of the star. So like kind of like a pentacross. And because its vines conceal countless pentacrine fossils, they can be found while working in the vineyards. The grape varieties consist mainly of Chardonnay, but they do also have Sauvignon and much, much lesser proportions, they do have pulsard. The white wines express the terroir of this AOC with elegance and finesse, and this wine is produced only over 67 hectares. The last bottle on this is what we have, the Cote de Jura, and the expression of diversity. July 31st, 1937, the Cotes de Jura Appalachian is the most extensive of the Jura Appalachians. It extends from north to south, which gives it a large number of terroir contrasts. And this constitutes a territory of discovery. And there are loads and loads of different expressions and the majority of variety, I'm sorry, variety of grape varieties there. And as you can see, all of these, this is what Debbie and I were talking about before we started. 
Um, all of the bottles have Jura um, on the bottle itself, like uh, engraved, not engraved, embossed on the bottles. The fifth is uh, AOC Macvin de Jura. This is known as the amazing uh, AOC. November 14th, relatively young, 1991. This covers all the AOC areas of the Jura wines, but represents only 5% of the total production. The Macvin de Jura belongs to a very closed French club of mistletoe, which is a type of liquor of the AOC. And it is the only one to be made from only one from a brandy so, uh, of a grape mark and not wine. Known since the 14th century, the Macvin de Jura is obtained from unfermented grape juice, must, to which one third of the brandy mark is added. This is regulated to be at least 10 months in oak barrels, and it must have uh, between 16 and 22 uh, percent alcohol to be obtained uh, to get this AOC. The varieties are five of them, Trousseau, Pulsar, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Sauvignon. Cremant de Jura AOC is the effervescence appellation. This was created only in 1995, October 9th. The production of sparkling wines in the Jura dates back to the end of the 18th century when the Jura wine growers mastered the traditional method. The Appalachian area is identical to that of the Côtes de Jura, Arbois, Chateau Chalon, and Etiol. The grape varieties authorized are the five again, Pulsard, Pinot Noir, Trousseau, Chardonnay, and Sauvignon. For the white, it's mostly Chardonnay. For the red, it is mostly Pinot and Trousseau. Uh, okay, and the last one, how cool is that bottle? That is way cool. Right. The last one is AOC Marc de Jura. So this is the mystery uh, AOC. Uh, this was very, very young. This was only created five years ago, February 2nd in 2015. This is the latest AOC de Jura appellation. The Marc de Jura appellation designates an amber brandy, an essential component of the famous Macvin de Jura. It has been distilled for centuries by Jura wine growers who consider it a heart warmer. Powerful and fragrant, it delights uh, any meal. Brandy is aged in wood with the exception of the quantities intended for industrial use or for compound products. So they designate how they age the wine by whether it is going to be sold as a personal consumption, like a bottle, like you can see in this picture. But if it's going to be a commercial uh, product, it does not get aged in wood, in, in barrels. No. That's so yeah, so they're separating, I mean, I don't wanna say that's a quality thing, but they're separating what this characteristic of this AOC is going to be, whether they're going to produce it for individual consumption or it's going out to a mass market. And I don't know if this is true or not, but like, I wonder if it's going out to a mass market, it's a primer to something else. Hmm. And then that commercial, that commercial company is going to then do something else to it. Um, I have no idea, but that was what entered my mind. I uh, expect candied grape with nuances of vanilla and a slight bitterness due to uh, copper. It is aged longer in wood and it rounds out the bitterness a bit and you can expect dried fruit aromas. This is um, volatile substances other than ethanol and methyl, alcohols of 400 grams per liter of pure alcohol and the title minimum alcoholic strength by volume is 40%. So you are getting hammered. So you we have some questions. Yes. We have some questions. So Karen wanted to know if the late harvest in the Jura is because the mountains block the sun. And um, I tried to look that up and I couldn't find an answer. I do not, I think they're doing it to specific, they're specifically harvesting it to be a late harvest. 
I don't know if that's what she's asking or not, but that that is specifically being because they oh, have so late harvest is is for late harvest wine. Yes. Gotcha. I yeah. meant that they harvest because I know here we've harvested um, cab from Long Island the beginning of December. Right. Now that's because of the weather. Yes. Right. Yes. And that's why right. the region is allowed to, to use capitalization is because they are keeping that fruit on the vines as long as they can to get to ripeness. And then they're picking the for ripeness for the majority of the wines. But then there's other that Sauvignon is staying on longer to produce a late harvest wine. Okay, gotcha. Okay. And um, Michael wanted to know um, from our boys, is Chardonnay one of the whites that's part of the 30%? I believe it is. Yes. Um, Agua. Um, yes, it is. Yeah, because they're they're allowed the five. They're allowed the five. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Chardonnay yeah. is. Um, but as they're they're known for oxida oxidized wines, which is fun. Mine know? is. Um, yeah, yours. Now I'm curious. Yours is aged. Right. I, I think mine is aged and ox. You know, actually, it's not really oxidized. It's it's more. Um, it's lost it. It's, it's, on, it's on the bottom of the bell shaped curve. Right. So it's it's yeah. already past its secondary and it's tertiary right because that color that color is a very aged white wine red this is red that's i'm, I'm, I'm sorry i'm sorry yeah sorry. because you can just barely taste the fruit i mean when i say barely it's it's barely right like it's it's very bricked which is, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're tawny. You're into tawny already. Yeah. 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 Maybe it's a tawny port. <laughs> no, I like it. <laughs> it's not. Wrong, wrong country completely. Wrong country. <laughs> All right. So let's, so I'll talk about, or do you want to talk about your? Sure. I'll talk about mine. I'm sorry. To sh I'm sorry to tell you, Deb. I'm enjoying mine. I know. I know. So this is what we're drinking, and and for those of you who are viewing this, you can see both of our labels, uh, both of our bottles have the Jura embossed onto it, and it seems like all of the pictures we see, all of the wines have that. Now I didn't read anything that that was required, but it seems to be kind of a consistent thing. So who do you have, Deb? I have um, Jean, Jean Bordy wines. He's like the oldest in the region. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have no, I have no idea. For all I know, this could be like worth $1,000 for all I know. Yeah. Uh, too bad it's done. <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to uh, talk about my wine or? Huh? What was that? Sure, go ahead. Oh, okay. So I actually have a. Um, well, give me time to drink. Okay, so you drink yours. Uh, mine obviously is 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 on the. It, it is past its peak. Um, if you see the, the cork, it's got. You know the the wine on it. So I don't know. Um, I can read you what it says on the back, and then I do have a presentation. Right. Um, it says according to the tradition of the family. I need, I need uh, new glasses. <laughs> the wine ages slowly during four years in old barrels before uh, bottling. The wine is made from 34% uh, Pinot, 33 Poussard, and 33 Trousseau. Uncork the bottle three to four hours before tasting. And that's what I did. That's, that's a lot of decanting. Yeah, yeah. So here, let me get my oops, my slideshow up for him. Uh, 
So uh, Domain Jean Borde. So those are. Uh, oh, that's the Clavin. Okay. Um, uh, Jean Bordy, um, as it's known, is one of the oldest domains in the Jura region. The founding domain goes back to between 1475 and 1500. Today, domain Jean Bordy is run by 15th generation Jean Philippe and Jean Francois Bordy, and it is one of the oldest continually operated wineries in the world. Pretty cool. I, I thought it was a nice picture of the, the vineyard with the soil. Um, in 2006, they converted the entire 10 hectare acre estate to biodynamic. And in 2010, they became uh, Demeter certified. So they put a lot of effort into, uh, into their vineyards. It's very important. Um, so they produce red blends that are Prasard, Pinot Noir, and Trousseau, and they make whites with Chardonnay or Savon, and of course, they make this very special Chateau Chalion, okay, which is aged more than six years and has a film uh, flora that protects the wine, and um, it's got one of the most complex noses that can be found in the wine world. And um, the Chateau Chalon is a village, and you went, went on the Appalachian, whose vineyards produce the most famous yellow wines from the Jura under the Appalachian of the Chateau Chalon AOC. And uh, so at um, the winery, they use old barrels in their winemaking. And some of these barrels are as old as 80 years old. They have a whole cellar of old vintages, thanks to all the generations before them. They have a library dating back to 1926. So cool. Yes, and I found that, that's way cool. So I, I also found that their pricing was very interesting. So they employ what's called like an old school method of offering. So the, the current release um, rests in the cellar for three to six months. So they'll release a portion of, of what they made. And then every 12 months, they'll release a little bit more of what they made. So like, you know, three years later, they still might be releasing, you know, the, the 2007 wine. And when they re release them, the price changes. So like if you get what say 2019, you get a 2019, say it's it's $20. In 2020, it's going to be $30. Right. So they're, they're kind of own, own on premier type thing. It's yeah. like getting, yeah. the, getting the wine, but. Yeah, so I thought that was just kind of neat, kind of and different, is, you know. Is that them specifically? Or is that, did you see if that that's was a them, no, That's them specifically. Oh, OK. Um, they call it an old school method by, by offering first trace pricing on the current release and then putting the rest in the cellar and then, you know, then they release it in increments. Oh, wow. Yeah. So like I said, my, uh, my wine is, is the blend. Um, the vineyard size is 3.2 hectare acres. The soil is red uh, clay and gavel. The average age of the vines that the grapes come from are 30 to 40 years. They are biodynamic Demeter certified. Um, they harvest by hand. Um, six to 10 day whole cluster fermentation with uh, natural yeast. Second fermentation before adding uh, to barrels. Uh, 48 months in old oak. And um, that's, that's about it. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So, but from what I understand, they're supposed to age, be age worthy, but mine age worthy out. <laughs> that happens sometimes. Yeah. You know, you know. More you, than I have to say, then, then they, they should. Yeah. Well, you, you said it was an 11? 11. So it's nine years old. 
Yeah, when you're saying age age worthy, you don't really think nine is age worthy. No. When I say like, you know, maybe it was, maybe it was. Well, like they have a seller dating back to 1926. So right, but you do have to remember when they're saying certain things like that seller has been imperfect. Those wines have not been. Right. Tied. But they you have, don't know that they might open it and it might be a. Right. Too. right. Yeah. I'm assuming. I'm assuming they've changed corks. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about that. No, no, you have to change corks like 20 years. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But nine years is not what I would expect. That like, that is seriously bricked. Yeah. That, I mean, maybe that was a bad bottle. I don't yeah. know. Um, I, like I said, I have no idea where I got it from. I just happened to be rummaging through my cellar one day and I saw it. I said, I got to take this for wine for that street. And it, it doesn't sound like that, like the Cote de Jura doesn't seem to be the oxidized wines. Right. No, it's not. Right. So. Um, oh, wow. All right. So once again, I have um, Frederick. Lornay, Charles Rouget, Côte de Jura Trousseau, which is a 2017. And I did kind of try to figure out who Charles Rouget was. Um, I don't know why it's named that. I'm not going to lie. I didn't spend a whole lot of time going down the rabbit hole. But I don't know. The winery um, is, is uh, Frederick Lorna, Lornay. Uh, so. Oh, that's pretty. Isn't it? Yeah. So this is what the winemaker states about the, this wine. Light ruby in color. I will definitely give him that. Aromas of red fruit and spice. I will give him that. Um, although then I get licorice, uh, but actually red licorice, like, um, uh, not Twizzler, vines, red vines. It smells like red vines. Um, the, they say the mouth offers flavors of raspberry and pepper. The palate is of medium body. I would go light body. Lingering finish on the palate. I think it's a little short on the on the uh, finish. Uh, pair with duck conf, uh, confit, rabbit, and brie cheese. So, you know, I'm only doing the brie. Uh, Based in the heart of Arbois, in the hillside village of montaigne les Assur, Fred is the second generation winemaker, taking over the one hectare vineyard owned by his father, Roger, uh, Roger Lornay. Roger was also the mayor of Montaigne. Roger's one hectare has become nearly 20 since he took over. Fred's range of wines are focused and mineral driven. The Lorinette family winery starts with Eugene, Frederick's grandfather, who was a cooper and a wine grower. Eugene's son, Roger, was one of the first of the Jura producers to bottle the in Arbois. And Frederick Lornette took over the family tradition producing elegant Jura wines, a uh, red and white. Their cellar is located in a 13th century Cistercian Abbey. Cool. Pretty, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Cistercian and the vines of the domain are planted on 16 <coughs> plots, which have been delimited in the past by the Cistercian, uh, Cistercians monks. Uh, the vines all have a southern exposure with an average of 30 years age, and they are planted on red clay and limestone. They purposely keep the yields low to focus on quality. The grapes are fully destemmed and fermented in oak uh, faudres, which are the big guys. Daily cap management, including pump overs, are continued 10 day fermentation, and then my wine is aged in. Um, oak barrels. So that's a, that is an image of the their um, Boyel with the Solaris, basically. And this 
Oh, how did I go into that? Oh, Deb, I did the wrong slide. <laughs> there we go. I was like, that's pretty, but that's not it. Hold on. That's me. Oh, that's you. Oh, my God. <laughs> Where the hell am I? You're there. There I am. Pardon moi. There he is. Okay. okay. There's Frederick. That is the only picture of Frederick on the entire internet. It is there about 50,000 times, but that is the only picture of him. And then that's the Abbey. And that's the only pictures there were. That looks more like an Abbey than the other. Yeah, yeah, the other, <laughs> the other. All right, so let me go into the food. So I'll get you guys out on the West Coast all hungry. I'm actually really digging this, Deb. Sorry. Uh, well. Mine would, how much, oh, you, you don't remember because it's so old. I Mine have no idea. 20. I don't know how much it cost. I don't know where I got it from. I don't know how it showed up. Yeah. Mine was $21. Okay, that's not bad. Hmm. So Jura is um, French Comte, which is known for cheese and charcuterie. Um, and traditional recipes are often with fatty sauces. Um, some specialties are made with green vegetables. Um, and this is interesting because the farmers had to produce most of their food. So they raised cows and pigs and produced their own meat and dairy. And menus were often composed of ham and cheese. And fondue is also um, popular due to um, the proximity to Switzerland. Oh, bacon? You got all that pig and no That's bacon? Not uh yeah no bacon uh now this is a montebellard montebellard sausage and it's a sausage made with pork smoked for 48 hours in a tied chimney using wood only to feed the fire and the true Mont monte sausage has a tiny piece of wood attached to it as well as a ring proving its authenticity all right that's kind of cool yeah so the traditional way to prepare them is with potatoes, like you see here. Um, cook some potatoes in a pan filled with half milk and half water. Add the sausages, cook for one and a half hours, and drain. Wow. So the difference between a morteau and a Montebillard sausage is the town. Okay. Now, the Montebillard sausage is shorter than the morteau sa sausage, but they're both produced the same way. So now we're going to go into our charcuterie. We're going into cheese. So yum, this, yum, is, yum. this is the Comte, Comte cheese. And it's funny because I order that a lot from Murray's, from Murray's cheese when I put in a cheese order. Love it. And then uh, more beer cheese. And I believe, and I want to say that's ash in it, if I'm correct. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I buy that too. <laughs> nope, 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 nope. Oh, you don't like that? that no. One? No. Oh, and then um, then we have, this is a cheese. This looks really good because you eat it with a spoon. It's called Mont Dior cheese. It's a cheese you eat with a spoon, and it's gooey, runny, and sticky. It's like, like a triple cream type thing. So um, good. Yeah, this is good. Um, so it's named after Mont Dior, which is a golden mountain in the Jura region. It's a raw milk cheese that's produced only between August 15th and March 15th. It has wow. a unique nutty taste from the spruce bark it's wrapped in. There are only 11 factories in the Jura region licensed to produce this cheese. It's a protected cheese, so you can eat and you can eat it hot. You just stick it in the oven for eight minutes. Drooling. I know. So now this is um, like a blue, a blue, a type of blue cheese, blue de get, blue de get, and it's also called blue de hot jora. It's a creamy, semi-soft blue cheese made from unpasteurized cow's milk in the Jura region. And besides eating it, you can make um, this uh, cipollini and uh, blue cheese tart. 
that I put on the bottom there. And cipollini are those little onions. And then we have Coke, Coke, Van, Coke of Van John. John, um, it's made with the orange wine. Hold on, hold on a second. Um, or not orange wine, the yellow wine. Yellow wine. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's made with the yellow wine. And then they also, dandelion salad. Oh, I love dandelions. Do you, they call it a uh, cremelot salad. Okay. So, and then we have breast chicken. So this chicken is produced from uh, white chickens, um, breast bread raised within the breast region of France. They're considered to be the best chickens in the world. And they have a genetic lineage that allows them to metabolize their food in a unique way, which helps to create a different flavor as well as meat and fat um, growth pattern. Additionally, the meat to bone ratio is vastly different from tra traditional chickens because their bones are quite thin and dainty. Oh, so dainty. if you can find this chicken, it, I would definitely give, give it a try. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's, it's, it's like um, Kobe beef, I guess you would say. It's the Kobe beef of, of chicken. <laughs> See, there is so much coolness about this region. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I was doing the food, I'm like, I've got to talk about the food from the region, you know, the cheese, because like, you know, the sausages, I thought that was really interesting with the sausages. So much coolness going on, so much coolness. All right, well, we are at that time that we're about to wrap it up. So we've got fast facts for you. So we'll start this slideshow again. <laughs> fast facts. The name Jura is derived from Juria, a Latinized form of the Celtic them Jor for, uh, for forest. Somewhere you also read that it's also like linked to Jurassic, but I couldn't. I couldn't find that in multiple places. So um, throwing that out there, don't know how true that is. The land under Vine occupies a very small area among the footholds of the Jura, amounting to about 2,000 hectares. And as I said earlier, it's almost it used to be almost five times that prior to the phylloxera, mildew, and World War I. Vajon is translates to yellow wine, and that's the oxidative style similar to sherry from the grape variety Savion. These guys just crack me up. In February, a different village in the Jura region hosts the Perse du Vin Jean. The weekend festival is a celebration of the unique wine and the particular region in which it was produced. And again, here's another like cool thing that they're like every year a different, you know, the different village kind of hosts it. Yeah. So we, right. They're they're spreading the wealth, spreading the pride, spreading everything. And it seems to be like a very small but neat little community that really cares about each other. Kind yeah. of cool. And wine isn't all that France's Jura region has to offer. In addition to the Vinjon and Pulsard grapes, the Jura region is also known for fine cheeses, especially the Gruyere and Comte. And little added fast fact, the Laughing Cow is from the Jura region. Yeah, I saw that. The Laughing Cow. So that is Jura. So I suggest if anybody is like visiting Burgundy and going out down that way, take a couple days afterwards and just hang, hang a right and go to the Jura region. Yep. And when I go and really hike my Swiss Alps, I'm going to the left. Well, thank you, Renee. So. 
So for but, next week, here's the link for next month. So we have some exciting news for next month. Again, we are going to be sponsored next month. And uh, we are going to be talking uh, the letter K. And uh, I'm going to say it wrong, and I should have checked how to say it. Um, but we are going to be sponsored by uh, you, the winery. Oh, the winery. Yeah, actually, I do have it right here. It is uh, Drizella, D-E-R-E-S-Z-L-A. And um, we're going to have the winemaker. It's a female winemaker by edit. Uh, B-A-I is her first name. E-D-I-T is her last. So really excited. And uh, so join us. Debbie, put the link in. What's the date? I did. What is the date? The date the is 21st. I think so. I'm looking at the thing. It says um, I don't know. I think it's the 21st. It's the third. Something's not working here right with the thing. So I'm going to have to fix that. Okay. It's the third Monday of the month. Yes, it's the third Monday of the month. Yeah, uh, Monday, August 17th. Oh, 17th. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know why this isn't, um, well, I'll have to fix this after. Oh, here it is, because I didn't hit register. Duh. What an idiot oh. I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, so thank you, everybody, for joining for Jay Fedora. I found it to be a really cool um, learning experience for me. I hope yeah. you guys too. And uh, yeah. we'll see. We don't want to keep you much longer than you know. We've already surpassed our hour. Yeah. So but. thank you so much. We will see everybody next month. If you uh, grab a bottle of Jura, please you know be sure to tag Debbie and me. And, Definitely. Uh, which and let me know how you enjoy it since I didn't get to enjoy mine. <laughs> yeah. That's so, all right. We'll see everybody next month. And Have uh, a great week. Stay safe. Deb, I'll send you a link. Okay. See okay. ya. Bye. Bye.